Hi there, my name is Sarah and I'm a scientist here at Science North. Today we'll be taking a better look at sound. Sound in humans is primarily used as a communication tool, and when I think of communication, I think of the spoken language. Humans have been able to really harness the power of sound and greatly improve our own lives. Think musical creations, telecommunications, this video even. We as humans have also developed technologies that use sound, mostly sound that we can't hear to see inside the human body or underwater. Think ultrasounds. In the animal world, sound is also an effective tool in communication, but not in the way that we as humans may think. The animals aren't necessarily transmitting sounds as language, but rather are using sound to warn others of their presence or attract others of their species or even to find food. Sound is energy. It is the result of vibrations that are traveling through a medium. Sound travels in what we refer to as waves and travels in all directions. When I think of sound traveling as waves, it seems logical to me that the molecule of air that first vibrates with the sound will actually travel to the ear. This is not the case. In fact, the individual air molecules don't travel at all as a result of sound energy. Instead, what happens is that this molecule vibrates and energizes the next molecule that in turn vibrates in the next and energizes the next one and so on and so forth until the molecule right next to your ear vibrates and the structures inside your ear sends the message to our brain, which will then be interpreted as sound. So I ask myself, if sound is simply energy vibrating individual molecules, how do we hear such a variety of sounds? To really understand this, we need to better understand the physics of sound. Anything that creates sound does this by vibrating the molecules near them. In humans, we generate sound with our vocal cords. Our vocal cords are essentially squeezing the air molecules together, creating an area of compression. When you create an area of compression, you in turn create an area of rarefaction. Compression is where the molecules will briefly be squished together, and rarefaction is where the molecules will briefly be farther apart. There are two main ways that a sound wave can change that affects what we hear. The first way a sound wave can change is by the magnitude of the wave, a louder sound. It'll vibrate more molecules, and this means that the areas of compression will be farther from one another because more molecules are involved. The greater the magnitude, the louder the sound, and this is measured in decibels. The other way a sound wave can change is the speed of the vibrating molecules. The speed determines the pitch of the sound, and we measure this in hertz and call this the frequency. Here I have a frequency generator and an amplifier, and on the screen is an oscilloscope displaying the sound wave visually. Let's turn these on. All right, and now let's see what happens to the wave when I change just the amplitude. Notice what happens. This oscilloscope visually represents the amount of molecules involved by making the wave higher. Notice though that the tone of the sound stays the same and the only difference is the loudness. This is amplitude. Now, if we leave the amplitude the same and we change just the frequency, the pitch, notice what happens. When the frequency is higher, the oscilloscope shows this as the peaks being closer together, which in essence illustrates that the molecules are moving faster. When the molecules are vibrating slower with a lower frequency, the oscilloscope represents this visually as the peaks being farther apart. If I turn the frequency generator as low as it goes, we can still hear the sound but sounds can be generated at frequencies much lower that we can't hear. We call this the infrasound range. Some animals like elephants are adapted to hearing infrasounds. Elephants use infrasound for communication because it can travel very far distances. On the other end of the scale, if I keep increasing the frequency, and I'll use this knob that increases it by 10 times, Notice that we stop hearing the sound. That's because it's the upper limit of human hearing is around 20,000 hertz, and we get into what we refer to as the ultrasound range. Even though we can't hear this sound the, in the animal world, this range is really quite useful. I'd like to introduce Ashley. 
She is another scientist at Science North and has with her our resident bat. Hi, Ashley. Hi. I'd like to introduce you to Rufus. Rufus is a big brown bat. Bats make use of sound primarily to find food and navigate while in flight. Right now, Rufus is actually generating sound. Can you hear it? No. Neither can I. This is because the sound he's generating is in the ultrasound range. Right, bingo, you got it. I have a tool here that will allow us to hear the sound Rufus is making. It really has a cool, super sophisticated name. It's a bat detector. But what it's really doing is simply converting the inaudible sound that Rufus is making to a frequency that the human ear can detect. The clicks? Yes, that's right. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Ashley. You're welcome. So Rufus uses sound to navigate so he doesn't hit the trees and other objects when he's flying around and also to find food, usually flying insects. This is called echolocation. So how does sound help him do this? Well, in the beginning, we mentioned that sound travels in all directions, and it does, but it also can be reflected. The sound reflects off of objects such as trees and the insects, and when the sound reaches the bat's ears, their brains can interpret what they're hearing to pinpoint the exact shape, size, location, and trajectory of the objects that are around them. There are other animals that use this type of echolocation, but they aren't all flying mammals. Dolphins can also use echolocation. You may be thinking, but is sound different in water? The essence of sound isn't but the speed at which it travels is affected by what it's traveling through. What sound travels through, we call the medium. So far, we've been talking about sound traveling through air. When, so when sound travels through the water, the main difference is that instead of vibrating air molecules, it's vibrating water molecules. And this, in fact, makes the sound wave faster. This may seem counterintuitive because we physically travel through the water much slower, but that's because the molecules of water are closer together than molecules of air. When we are physically moving through the molecules, whether it be air or water, we need to move the molecules out of the way. The more of them there are in a given space, the harder it is. But sound is just an energy transfer, and the closer the molecules are to one another, the faster the energy can transfer can happen. So I ask you, if sound travels through a solid, will it travel faster or slower? I know we've only just scratched the surface with the physics of sound and that there are many other facets of sound to explore. But in the meantime, enjoy the beauty of sounds in nature and know that there are many sounds you aren't actually hearing.